Hello. Today, I'd like to share with you my thoughts on the poem by T.S. Eliot entitled Bernard Norton. Uh, the poem uh, grapples with the problem of time, how uh, human beings first uh, came to be under the enchainment uh, of uh, time. The Greek word for time is uh, chronos. Uh, the Greeks have two different words for uh, time, kairos and uh, chronos. Uh, kairos means uh, the appropriate time, the opportune time uh, to do something. Whereas the uh, sequence of um, passing time is uh, represented by the word uh, chronos. So I am today uh, addressing the second type of uh, time because this is the theme of uh, T.S. Eliot in uh, Bernd uh, Norton. My guess is that soon or later, we all uh, have to be occupied um, by the problem of uh, time, whether consciously or unconscious unconsciously, uh, it doesn't uh, matter. In, in, in this uh, occupation, there seems to be two contradictory um, thoughts about time. The first is that we, we come to realize, especially as we get uh, older, that time is rather short. Uh, our existence here on Earth is brief. Uh, first, we come to uh, feel uh, anxious about this passing of time, and then we uh, regret. And then, of course, finally, we uh, resign uh, into accepting the, the, the fact. Uh, it seems to be the, uh, the case. But the second aspect of time that occupies us uh, is that time is rather sometimes too long. Uh, there is the, the word, uh, let's kill time because time seems to extend to, to infinity. The reason being, um, no matter uh, what type of uh, background, how privileged you are, or from what type of background you come, uh, life is rather boring. To a certain uh, age, uh, sometimes instinct, sometimes appetency, uh, sometimes curiosity, uh, sometimes our hobbies would take us, but only so long uh, until we realize that most of the goals we pursue here on earth are rather secondary goals. And our mind uh, deeply craves for rather primary fundamental goals, if at all we, we know what they are. So these contradictory um, aspects of time at one time or another uh, occupies us all. Uh, here I have uh, listed some of the most important or prominent people who have in the past grappled with uh, time. I'll begin with uh, Pl uh, Plato and Aristotle. These two uh, philosophers think that time is rather everlasting. It has always been there and it will always uh, be uh, subjecting uh, everybody and everything in creation uh, without uh, partiality. Uh, Aristotle, in fact, consider uh, the existence of an infinite time uh, essential to avoid the first cause for creation. Uh, Aristotle assumes, uh, assumed rather that 
creation existed infinitely uh, from time immemorial to uh, infinite time in the future, uh, this avoids the necessity of having a first cause. The, the first, to my knowledge at least, uh, philosopher who closely examines time is uh, Boethius, the 6th century uh, Roman senator and uh, philosopher, uh, predominantly Aristotelian by himself, but he clearly distinguished himself uh, from Aristotelian uh, philosophy as regards uh, time. In his book, The Consolation of uh, Philosophy, uh, Boethius differentiates between eternity and time. Uh, he defines eternity uh, as a condition in which past, present, and future are all contained in a single instance. So no time is lost in, in eternity. And God only occupies uh, eternity. And he argued that whatever notion we wish to form about God is incomplete because we are unable to grasp or find ourselves in uh, eternity. Uh, whereas time, according to uh, Plato, is everlasting, uh, but there is a, a clear distinction between uh, our, uh, Plato's time and Boethius' uh, time. Boethius thinks that time is a creation. There was a start and there will be an end uh, to, to time. And time imitates eternity by moving. So consider uh, you are standing outside a splendid big villa with so many uh, windows, and you wish to look into the uh, into this villa. Let's suppose that there is only a single splendid room inside this uh, villa. So, if you wish to uh, regard the objects inside this room, it doesn't matter really whether it's only a single room or multiple room. But let's assume that it's just a single room. You will have to go from one window to to another. Uh, so that means you have to move in order to get uh, knowledge of the whole uh, room uh, and the objects it contains. But in doing so, you have to abandon uh, one window after another. So Boethius argues that time imitates eternity by moving from past to present, and then the, the, the present will be past and comes the future to be a present. And he assumes that we human beings are in time, whereas God is in time. Suppose a person were inside this splendid villa. He doesn't need, again, this uh, example is rather, uh, incomplete or imperfect, but imagine a person inside this room could see the whole room and the objects in it with a single view without moving. So he says God being inside eternity or God containing eternity, he doesn't need to, to move. So, and no time escapes him. The past, the future and the present are all contained in eternity. Whereas for us who, who are outside eternity and subject to time, we have to experience or imitate eternity by moving. But in doing so, we always retain the present. T.S. Eliot in this poem, which we are going to expound today, seems to agree with uh, Boethius. Coming uh, uh, from Boethius to Newton, uh, Newton for his system of uh, motion, uh, mechanical motion, he assumes that time is absolute. Uh, 
implicitly he seems to agree with Aristotle that time is with God, but is still subject to God, not uh, you know uh, having been uh, from infinity with God. Uh, Newton, being a Christian, he uh, believes that uh, God created time, but then time seems to be absolute, subjecting all creation and invariable. Uh, this was fundamental for him to uh, put in place all the mechanical uh, equations. His contemporary, the philosopher and mathematician Leibniz, had rather an interesting con uh, uh, understanding of time. He argues that both time and space, they don't actually exist. They are relational properties. They are there as long as objects are there. If, for example, objects were not moving, we would never experience time. So the, the movement or the rotation of uh, planetary uh, objects gives us the illusion of time. Similarly, we think about space only because there are objects which are placed relative to, uh, apart from uh, one another. Uh, then uh, from Leib Leibniz comes uh, Immanuel Kant. Uh, in his uh, most important and fundamental work, uh, critic of uh, pure uh, reason, uh, Kant believes that, or he argues that we don't actually know whether time and space exist. We cannot be sure. But in us, embedded in our thinking, uh, we are given a priori, without any experience, the capacity to recognize the boundaries of objects, the, the unity in, in object, the relative position between, uh, between objects and the movement of objects. That enables us to establish a concept of time and space. So the the idea of time and space we have is in us, and we don't know whether they really exist outside. Uh, of course, after Einstein, the most significant, uh, after Immanuel Kant, the most significant person is Einstein. Uh, Einstein is a determinist. He uh, agrees by and large uh, with the philosophy of uh, Spinoza, Baroque Spinoza, and in his general relative, uh, general theory uh, of um, relativity, he seems to suggest that time and space are creations and they subject themselves to uh, creation. They uh, in other words, uh, up to that point, time is considered to be really a master. Here in, in this um, build, I have depicted the uh, uh, Titan Chronos, uh, not the time uh, X, but uh, K, um, the, the, the Greek uh, Titan Chronos, uh, which is the son of the god Jupiter and um, Gaia. Uh, so in, in, in Einstein, time is creation. It's a part of creation. It modifies the fabric of creation, the energy, the, 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 the stress, the strain, the forces or the, 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 that exist in creation. But at the same time, these entities also have the, the, the power to change both the, the fabric of space time. Uh, the philosophical significance of uh, Einstein's uh, field equation is that up to that point, scientists had difficulty how to classify time. 
uh, a space you can easily modify. For example, if I put an object uh, in front of me, I modify the, 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 the space. But I, I don't know how to modify time. I don't know how to interact with time. So Aristotle has difficulty in his ontology to classify time, which is why he thought that time was outside of creation. Uh, because if it's, a, if it's a, a part of creation, then it has to be a substance or a property of a substance. And this substance should be modified because it should interact with, with, with other substances. And he, up to the, 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 up to the, the, the time of Leibniz, uh, both philosophers and physicists, they did not know how to uh, categorize uh, time. Einstein, Einstein seems to answer this question because in his field equation, uh, we have time and space, the, the time and space uh, tensor or the uh, metric tensor on, on one side. And on the other side, we have the, the energy uh, stress tensor. The energy stress tensor describes the geometry of uh, bodies, uh, whereas time and space are on the other side. And this equation seems to suggest that space and time affect the, 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 the geometry of moving uh, objects, where, for example, they affect gravity. At the same time, however, these objects also interact and modify space and uh, time. Uh, in in Burns Norton, T.S. Eliot addresses not as such the essence of time, but when and where, rather where, time enters into creation. He seems to agree with Boethius, but goes a little further to say, or to suggest that being a bondage to time, was not the initial plan in, in creation. Uh, and he seems to suggest where time first enters into human life and how we can move out of this, this bondage. So we're going to see his views on on this regard. So the, the, the uh, poem begins by saying the following. Again, here he agrees with uh, Boethius. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future. And time future contained in time past. Here he, he's, he seems to suggest that there is a condition under which time is not lost. So he seems to point to Boethius's eternity where everything is contained, nothing is lost. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. So you can see that in eternity, I, I have said, uh, nothing escapes from eternity and God sees past, present and uh, future in one instance of viewing. And in, in, in this eternity, nothing is lost and you cannot redeem because you redeem something you've lost. This is a very important uh, realization uh, because if you are with an eternity, uh, you will have the past, the present, and the future hopefully reconciled 
uh, at, at your uh, disposition or at, at your disposal. So as I said, the main aim of the, the poem is to show us where first time enters into human experience. And here to guide us into this, into this place, he seems to say to choose a bird. Uh, T.S. Eliot being a Christian, he knows that this bird implicitly um, uh, represents the Holy Spirit. You remember the bird after, after the baptism of Jesus, uh, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended a, a, in the form of a dove and um, rested uh, at the shoulder of uh, Jesus. So he seems to allude to this epiphany to guide us into this lost world that we first time entered into human uh, experience. So let's see. What might have been and uh, what might have been is an abstraction remain a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. So you can see that when we are outside of time, you cannot contain the whole spectrum of time because we always find ourselves in the present, having lost the, 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 the past and hoping for the arrival of the, the future. So eternity is possible only in, in, in the mind or in, uh, as a speculation. We cannot experience eternity as we are, as, as long as we are in, in time. So he says what might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. So for those people who are subject to time, their property is only the present. You can make use of the present. You don't own the past and the future. This changes when you enter into eternity, where you have also a spectrum of time. Now look, footfalls echo in the memory down the passage which we did not take, towards the door we never opened, into the rose garden. My words echo this in your mind, but to what purpose? Disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves, I do not know. Before I explain these verses, let me digress a little. Uh, in an interview he gave in 1959 to the BBC, the psychoanalyst uh, Carl Jung suggests that the human psyche lives outside of time, both outside of time and, and space, uh, which makes sometimes difficult to treat the human psyche because it mixes uh, memory and desire to create uh, an entirely new, new world and to exist into this new world and uh, bringing the neurotic out of this world it could sometimes be impossible. Immanuel Kant also uh, in his uh, second book, in his second most significant book, The uh, Practical Reason, a critic to the uh, critic of the practical reason, his justification for the existence of moral laws is that there is something in human beings that is not a part of time, for, right? The, the moral imperatives can be justified if only human beings have the capacity to exist outside of time. Because if they are subject to time, so all their behavior and decisions and judgments are subject to time. It is something they have inherited from, from their parent and the parent have inherited that it from uh, their, uh, their parent too. So if, if, if all our decisions are guided by timely behaviors, 
we cannot really make human beings accountable to their decision. We can make them accountable or we can believe in free will if there is some element in their, in their, in their uh, cognition which is not subject to time. Freud too seems to suggest that there is some element in the human psyche. Uh, he suggested that it is inherited uh, because we all, for example, feel guilty. We don't know why, but we feel guilty. And he suggested that this sense of guilt is not uh, a product of the now and the here. It is something embedded in, in human beings. The reason I mention about this timelessness is that here too, um, T.S. Eliot alludes that there is something in us which we can always call to attention, which is not subject to time. So here he says, footfalls echoes in the memory. So in, in us, if we really listen to this echo, it can lead us somewhere. The law of consciousness, says St. Paul in his brief to the Romans in the New Testament. And this echo can bring you to a garden. And it seems in this garden where time first enters into human life, not necessarily into creation, but in at least into human consciousness. So now he is going to lead us into this, into this world. Other echoes inhabit the garden. Shall we follow? So you see, first there is an echo leading you to this rose garden. And then as soon as you follow this echo, you also hear other echoes. But you need to decide to follow in order to experience. Quick, said the bird. You see now he's talking about this bird. Find them, find them round the corner through the first gate into our first world. Shall we follow the deception of the trash? into our first world. Interestingly, it seems to be a deception. You, you, you can, uh, you can uh, conclude that this is not a real voice. This is a voice I am making up. This is the voice I, I think I'm hearing, but it's all a deception. But if you listen long enough and trust this echo, may lead you some, somewhere. There they were, dignified, invisible, moving without pressure over the dead leaves in the autumn heat through the vibrant air. And the bird called in response to the unheard music hidden in the shrubbery and the unseen eye beam crossed for the roses had the look of flowers that are looked at. Pay attention to the words I uh, marked in, in violet. In this garden, there are echoes, there are people populating this garden, but they are invisible. They also move, but they move without pressure. They also produce music, but this music cannot be heard through the, 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 the normal sensory organs. And their eyes, you cannot see. But there are people, this garden, where first time entered into creation is populated with, with some people. And these people, there they were at our guests, accepted and accepting. So we moved and they in a formal pattern along the empty alley into the box circle 
to look down into the drained pool. Dry the pool, dry concrete, brown edged. And the pool was filled with water out of sunlight. And the lotus rose quietly, quietly. The surface glittered out of heart of light. And they were behind us, reflected in the pool. Then a cloud passed and the pool was empty. Let's investigate his, his experience in this garden. In this garden, there is a pool. It's an ordinary pool, rusty and empty. But in this garden, you, you can experience a brilliant light. And the light shines into the, into the pool, giving you the impression that the pool is filled with light, uh, with water. If you see long enough with concentration, you can even see the, the, the lotus writhing in, in, in this pool. And in this garden, you can see them behind you, their image reflected in, in the pool. This is alluding to the first uh, man and woman, to Adam and Eve, and the, the garden is the, the garden of Eden. But remember this pool and the experience are all, you can, you can call them illusion, but the spiritual experience also, because a cloud may pass and the whole experience disappears, cloud of doubt, and then it disappears. Remember, this whole experience is just in, in your mind. Remember, he, he began by saying uh, there is an echo. We are hearing in the memory, echoes in the memory. And you, you hear of other uh, echoes too. But to strengthen your sense of reality, to strengthen that you are not actually, to strengthen the belief that you are not actually dreaming or in, in, you know, experiencing illusion, the bird says, go, says the, said the bird, for the leaves were full of children, hidden excitedly, containing laughter. Go, 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 said the bird. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Time past and time future, what might have been and what has been, point to one, which is always present. He, he distinguishes very subtly two different experiences, an experience outside of time and an experience in time. The out, and he says, the leaves are full of children in this, in this garden, containing laughter. It's a positive experience. It is a garden where life is bursting forth uh, with merriment. The, the guests, they are accepting and are being accepted. The children are containing laughter. There is music to, to hear. There is a pool full of water. There are lilies or uh, lotus growing in this. And T.S. Eliot says that this actually is reality. This is the real one. The one we are living in, where we have objective uh, uh, objects or tangible objects. It's not real. The real one are the one which is echoing in your memory. The one where master time reigns, where you experience only the present is not the real one. But he says humankind cannot bear very much reality. It's difficult to, to get in and stay in this spiritual world. And then he says, 
when you come out of this, it's all time again rolling. Time past and time future, what might have been and what has been point to an end, which is always present. So he says, it is possible to experience the spiritual world which is outside of time, but it needs the guidance of the bird and you're obeying the echo you hear in your, in your memory. And here he says, he, he, he speaks about how time imitates eternity. Uh, in, in simple words, he is trying to express in verses what po uh, Boethius expressed in, in, in prose. That means time imitates eternity by moving. The trilling wire in the blood sinks below invertebrate scars, appeasing long forgotten wars. The dance along the arteries, the circulation of the lymph, are figured in the drift of stars. Ascend to summer in the tree, we move above the moving tree, in light upon the figured leaf, and here upon the sodden floor below the bowhound in the boar. Pursued their pattern as before, but reconciled among the stars. So, what unites us with creation here, and uh, is a, a confirmation that we are subject to time, is that everything in us moves. You know, in our artery, in our lymph system, lymphatic systems, in our blood circulation, everything moves. And if you just gaze above and see the stars, they too obey the, the law of movement. And that makes us subject to time. When we are in time, we are just like all the other objects populating the, the universe. And by contrast, in the next few verses, he expresses the, the timeless. Again, a depiction borrowed from uh, Boethius's uh, consolation of uh, philosophy. At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither form nor towards, at the still point, there the dance is, but neither rest nor movement, and do not call it fixity where past and future are gathered. Neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline. Except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance and there is only the dance. I can only say there we have been, but I cannot say where. And I cannot say how long, for that is to place it in time. Uh, one of the arguments of Aristotelians in the classic times uh, for the existence of God is the following. Creation is essentially uh, made up of heterogeneous or diverse parts or elements. If these diverse parts or diverse forces come together, then somebody must have brought them because diverse means they, they don't, they cannot coexist. So for example, we, in, in physics, we have four different forces, right? We have the, the gravitational force, we have the electromagnetic force, we have the weak nuclear force, and we have the strong uh, nuclear force. So far, we are not able to find uh, an equation with, uh, which unifies uh, this, uh, these forces, the uh, Einstein's lifelong struggle was to find uh, this equation which unifies them. There's some, some we, we sense that there is some, some resemblance or there is some underlying uh, similarity, but so far it's not successful. If we assume that these forces are indeed heterogeneous, that means someone must have brought them together 
for them to coexist. In the Aristotelian art, another component, which is motion. Not only where this, these elements are brought together, but someone also set them in motion. That means there is definitely an external, eternal, immutable uh, agent, which Aristotle calls God. And here, uh, uh, T.S. Eliot is alluding to, to this one. Imagine you have a, a, a wheel, a, a bicycle wheel. If the bicycle is moving, the, 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 the elements which are farther away from the center, they, they move rather at a higher speed. But those which are nearer to the center, that they move slowly. And there is a point at the center where there is absolutely no movement. And Boethius depicts God with this moving wheel. At the center of this, this, this turning world, there is God and God himself is, is unmoving. And he depicted the whole, you remember uh, Dante, the Divine Comedy, he, um, the, the very title of the book implies that creation is dancing out of joy. Uh, the, the movement uh, uh, signifies a, a divine dance, a divine comedy. So uh, T.S. Eliot is alluding to this uh, depiction and he says experiencing uh, immutability let's say or coming near to this to this to the center of the rotating wheel is comparable to going out of time so it is possible to experience the coming out of time Again, by by phase or by by yes, by phase. Only then he says he himself seems to have this this experience. I can only say there I have been. That means he had the experience. It is possible to experience eternity. We don't know how it is, how, how at least I don't know how it is, but he seems to have experience and retain this knowledge, but he cannot say for how long, because that is to put it in time, because eternity is outside of time. And I don't, I cannot say for how long, for that is to place it in time. Let me repeat it again. I can only say there we have been, but I cannot say where. And I cannot say for how long, because that is to place it in time. So here on us, even being subject to time, it is possible to come out of time and experience eternity. And now he shows us how you can experience, how, the how part, the way out of time. The inner freedom. So the, the first thing to experience eternity is to have some freedom. And this freedom is freedom from practical desire. The inner freedom from the practical desire, the release from action and suffering, release from the inner and the outer compulsion, yet surrounded by a grace of sense, White light still and moving, a heaven without motion, concentration without elimination, both a new world and the old made explicit, understood in the completion of its partial ecstasy, the resolution of its partial horror. So the way to come out of time is not by dying, physically dying. I mean, he believes in, in, in afterlife, but here he is not really talking about afterlife. 
while still occupying all your senses and cognitive faculties, it is still possible to experience eternity, he says. And that is, the first is you, you have to be free from desire. Desire or appetency or your appetite or passions always hold you back from experiencing eternity. Uh, another thing that holds us back is activity. Uh, in the sounds of music, uh, classical uh, children movie, uh, the, um, the proponent says, activity suggests life, right? We, we are bored when we have nothing to do. As long as we do, we feel alive, we feel uh, existing. But the escalate here says, activity always distracts you from the most important reality. Because when you're active, you, you don't pay attention. You are not really conscious. We will come to that a uh, uh, short while later. So the first step to come out of time is attaining an inner freedom from compulsion, uh, from the desire to do. Uh, we human beings uh, always think, especially men, that we find our identity by doing things, by accomplishing something. And here T.S. Eliot says, uh, in fact, in order to experience eternity, you have to abandon the notion of doing or achieving something. Uh, while you do this, he says, still you retain your, all your faculties. And it seems that you have a grace of sense. You, you know, you are aware of your surrounding. You are aware of the people uh, with you. You are not abandoning them. You are not shunning them off. Still, it is possible to, 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 to release this urge to possess, to do, to accomplish, to perform. He says, Erhebung, Erhebung to be, to be lifted up, to be able to free yourself from the gravitation of the flesh, but without motion, without doing anything, without activity. You can concentrate, but without elimination, without eliminating your, your, your surrounding, without isolating yourself. And in this experience, both a new world and the old world can be made explicit. You are still living, existing in this world, but it is possible to experience a new world too, a spiritual world. And both can be understood. In the completion of its partial ecstasy, the resolution of its partial horror, it's also horrible. Because remember, you are now being at the boundaries where time and the timeless meet. And in engineering, we call this uh, boundary and nonlinear uh, condition. And it could be quite horrible, quite frightful to enter into the spiritual world and experience eternity requires courage. Yet the enchainment of past and future woven in the weakness of the changing body protects mankind from heaven and damnation, which flesh cannot endure. That means the body cannot abide staying in eternity for so long. So that means as long as here we are here on earth, we can experience eternity only briefly. There are only moments in and out of time. 
And of course, when we come out of eternity, we find time again. Time past and time future are low but a little consciousness. To be conscious is not to be in time. So this is the secret. As long as we, we are busy here on earth, doing, accomplishing, planning, pursuing some goals, we are actually not conscious. We are divorced from the real world, according to T.S. Eliot, which is the spiritual world. But to be conscious is not to be in time. So as soon as you, you are conscious, you understand the all the rest cease to matter. All the rest cease to exist for you. But only in time can the moment in the rose garden, the moment in the arbor where the rain bit, the moment in the Trotty church at Smokeford be remembered, involved with past and future. Only through time, time is conquered. So he says here on earth, time has still some advantages, some purpose, because whatever we experience, even this experience of eternity is made in time, paradoxically. So time has some, some purpose. Our memory, the memory of good, good, good deeds, the memory we had in the church, the beautiful song, the beautiful time of prayer, the consolation and uh, comfort with our brothers and sisters, all this can be experienced only in time. So time has some, some, some purpose to serve here on earth. And here he gives us some, some glimpse of human existence. Here is a place of disaffection, time before and time after, in dim light. He says, imagine our life here on earth, as long as we are prisoners of time, we are looking in a dim light. It is as if looking in a dim light, neither darkness, no, no brilliant light, but in a dim light. So he explains what it means to live either in darkness or in, 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 in brilliant light. Neither daylight, investing form with lucid stillness, turning shadow into transient beauty with slow rotation suggesting permanence. So when there is a perfect light at home or outside, you discern objects easily, you discern their boundary, you discern their shape, you, you see and understand. Our existence here on earth is not like that. We cannot see perfectly, you remember in, um, in the Bible, in the New Testament, in his first um, letter to the Corinthians, uh, in the 13th chapter, uh, the Apostle Paul says, here on earth we know only partially, as if we are seeing things in a perfect mirror, uh, in an imperfect mirror. So existence, T.S. Eliot says, uh, un uh, under its best condition is like looking in a dim light. And no darkness to purify the soul, emptying the sensual from de with deprivation, cleansing affection from the, uh, the temporal. When we are in spiritual darkness, uh, nobody likes it, I don't like it, but darkness has also some important purpose. That means it purifies you. It helps you to isolate the temporal from the trans, uh, from, from the the um, even sent. The sorry, the, the permanent from the temporal. Uh, emptying the sensual with deprivation, cleansing affection from the from the temporal. But again, we are not in in in, in darkness. Partially we are, because looking in, in a dim light means there is the, 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 the union of light and darkness. So we may experience uh, both, sometimes we see clearly, but sometimes uh, also we are uh, in a dry ground or in a, in a dry land. Uh, and then our 
uh, earthly um, appetites and uh, desires uh, should be uh, tested. Neither plenitude nor vacancy, only a flicker of the strain time written faces, distracted from destruction by destruction, filled with fancies and empty of meaning, to meet apathy with no concentration, men and bits of paper whirled by the cold wind that blows before and after time, wind in and out of unwholesome lungs. So here is our, here he depicts our present condition here on earth. It's a condition where we don't have abundance of experience, spiritual experience, but not entirely devoid of it. We, we have some, some experience if we could build uh, on that. Amazingly, he says, we are also steadily, continuously distracted by destruction from destruction. It seems a, a play with words, but it has some important purpose. Let me give you an example. Take pain. Uh, when you are, when, when it hurts you, all other interests, uh, they may not cease to exist, but they become only secondary. So that, that means time or pain distracts you from all these secondary uh, important. So distracted from destruction by destruction. But at the same time, uh, this, this earthly or secondary goals or uh, desires, they also distract you, distract you from, from the most important goal, which is the pursuit of, of life, the spiritual life. So you have the spiritual life, you have the secondary interest, and now you have pain. So pain distracts you from, from the secondary interest, the secondary interest which distracts you from, from your most important uh, goal in, in life. So what we, this type of experience is the kind of experience we have as long as we are subject to, to time filled with fancies and empty of meaning. To meet apathy with no concentration. This is the, how he expresses life in time. Descend lower, descend only into the world of perpetual solitude. World, not world, but that which is not world internal darkness, deprivation, and destitution of all property, desiccation of the world of sense, evacuation of the world of fancy, inoperancy of the world of spirit. This is another way of experiencing eternity, by dying. I think uh, Christians understand what it means, but by mortifying the flesh, you can revive the, the, the spirit. And this is what he is alluding, alluding to. You know, letting go of earthly interest uh, and destitution of all property. Desiccation, desiccation is the process of removing all the, 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 the water from, from living object, for example, from a tree or from a wood you cut or from the human uh, body desiccation of the world of sense. That means here on us, or a typical symbol of being subject to time is that the senses take precedence in our life, in our existence. So you have to let go of senses and passion and appetency to have the experience of uh, eternity. Uh, evacuation of the world of fancy, inoperancy of the world of spirit. Desire is, itself is movement, not in itself desirable. Love itself is unmoving, 
only the cause and end of movement. Timeless and undesiring, except in the aspect of time, caught in the form of limitation between unbeing and being. Here he is alluding to Christ. Christ, you, you remember the Aristotelian depiction of God? God is, sub, is said to be immutable. He is not in motion. He brings things into motion, but nobody brings God in, in motion. So this is why they, are, they assume that God, God is immutable. Christ being the son of God, he himself is immutable. But because he comes to us to, to save us, he has made himself a human being. That means he become now unbeing, according to T.S. Eliot. He was a being, the most important being, you know, for us, total substance, the most important substance is God. So he, for, for T.S. Eliot, the most important being, love, Jesus, has become unbeing, a human being. He, he subjected himself to time where he, in essence, is timeless. So code in the form of limitation between unbeing and being. Sudden, in a shaft of sunlight, even while the dust moves, there rises a hidden laughter of children in the foliage. Quick now, there, now, always. So here, the whole world, or the whole poem which I was expounding so far, was it for T.S. Eliot expounded by this bird who is saying now, quick now, here now, always. Ridiculous, the waste sad time stretching before and after. The reason he says ridiculous is that it's almost regrettable that we don't experience the spiritual world. It's regrettable that we are subject to, to time. But if we listen to the bird and the echoes in our memory, there is the opportunity to experience eternity and thereby come out of time. By this comes, uh, the, the poem comes to the conclusion. And I also come to the conclusion of my expounding. Thank you for listening. And of course, uh, Goodbye from me.